All right, hello and thank you for joining us today. We are so excited to continue the historic Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip for its second season. We have an amazing series of presentations planned for you over the coming months with six participating artist home sites, including Pasaquan, which is the third stop on this year's virtual road trip. Uh, this historic uh, uh, Artist Homes and Studios virtual road trip series is a collaboration between the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios program, also referred to as HAWS. We launched this virtual presentation series last year in response to the recently published Guide to Historic Artist Homes and Studios, written by none other than Valerie Belint, the program manager of Haas. I have a copy right here. It's a beautiful book. Um, as many of us were stuck at home during the pandemic, Valerie's book provided us a way to uh, vicariously adventure into the creative spaces of many American artists. Uh, this virtual road trip became the next best thing. So for those of you just learning about the Historic Artist Homes and Studios program, this is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. PAUSE is a coalition of 55 sites across 25 states that were previously the homes and working studios of many American artists. And through its support and advocacy, PAUSE is helping to preserve the nation's legacy of creativity in the visual arts by connecting visitors to these remarkable spaces. So my name is Mackenzie Dunstan, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, uh, located on the ancestral and unceded uh, territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. The James Castle House has been a member of Haas since 2019 and uh, we're your unofficial stop on this virtual road trip. Um, and so I would encourage you to learn more about our museum here in Boise. With me today is Valerie Blint, the program manager of Haas, and Michael McFalls, the director of Passive One. Providing American Sign Language interpretation today are Michelle and Sierra. So before we get started, I'd like to address just a few housekeeping items. We are committed to making this program accessible and are integrating accessibility through ASL interpretation and English language captions. So captions are available by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitle. We strongly encourage your questions throughout this presentation. You can send your questions to us through the Q&A box and we will answer as many as we can at the end of today's presentation. This event is also being recorded and will be made available online in the coming weeks. You can find this and other recordings from the Haas Virtual Road Trip on the James Castle House YouTube channel. And at the end of this presentation, we will also add links to related events, resources, and mailing lists. So because this is a virtual road trip, I'd like to set the stage and offer a few travel notes for us to consider before we get started. Uh, last month, we visited the Ann Norton Sculpture Gardens in West Palm Beach, Florida. The journey between West Palm Beach and Pasaquan, which is located in Buena Vista, Georgia, is the shortest leg of this year's road trip, uh, with just about an eight hour drive between the two sites. So although you could certainly do this drive in a day, uh, we'd recommend breaking the stretch of the trip up into at least two days, uh, though you'll probably want more, there's so much to see. So as you head um, out of West Palm Beach uh, for the first leg of your drive, uh, you may want to head to the Ocala National Forest to enjoy some water-based recreation on one or several of its 600 natural lakes. Uh, wildlife abounds in this area with manatee, alligator, and even bear sightings, uh, fairly common for visitors. Once you've had your fill of the great outdoors, travel just a little further north to Gainesville, Florida to explore the city's urban art project called 352 Walls. You can enjoy a guided tour of this expansive collection of public art and murals, fittingly called the Walls Walk, uh, to experience the city through the lens of art and culture. So there's a lot to explore once you actually cross state lines into Georgia. 
So before we reach our final destination of Pasaquan, I'd like to invite Valerie to share some of her recommendations when traveling in this area. Thank you, Mackenzie, and to, to you and everyone involved at the James Castle House for spearheading this virtual road trip in collaboration with historic artists' homes and studios. I am excited to have us continue this year's series with an artist in sight only recently accepted into this program and representing the first vernacular artist designed environment to be brought into this network, um, but I certainly hope it's not the last. I first <clears throat> learned about Pasaquan through my colleague Lisa Stone, a longtime advocate for these types of sites and artists and a member of the Haas Leadership Committee. At that time, Lisa headed the Roger Brown st uh, Study Collection, the home of Chicago imagist Roger Brown, who himself had been a collector of and champion for self-taught artists. And you have an image of Brown and a detail of his house and his collection uh, lower left on your screen. But it was at an annual conference of the Southeastern College Art Association that I heard a young scholar present on Pasaquan and got a true deep dive into the man, the philosophy, and the artistic talent that all complete the tapestry that is this singular place. I have yet to go there. And as I imagined my first trip, I wove the recommendations of our guide today, Mike McFalls, with a few other places that I felt would keep me in the spirit of what Pasaquan already represents to me. Those who choose the road less traveled in life and art, eclecticism coupled with authenticity and bravery to be different and to embrace it. For those like myself who are still just learning about self-taught creatives, a good place to start is the High Museum in Atlanta, which boasts a strong collection, while also providing a potential home base for ultimately making a two hour Southern pilgrimage to Buena Vista, where Pasaquan is located. Here you will encounter this work on your screen by Eddie Owens Martin, which you see in the upper center of your screen, a figure like those uh, seen at Pasaquan. And you will discover dozens of other artists, including Bill Trailer, whose work can be found at the Roger Study Brown Study Collection, or this piece by Clementine Hunter, depicting Melrose Plantation in Louisiana, where Hunter worked for decades and which is now a member site in our network. I often like to say that visiting Haas sites is like taking an Art Survey 101 course, uh, while visiting the High Museum is like taking a self-taught artist 101 class, and it's the perfect precursor to experiencing Pasaquan. Next slide, please, Michael. Another great locale to serve as the central hub for this excursion is the city of Columbus. From here, it's only about 40 minutes southwest to Buena Vista and Bahasaquan. While here in one of the first planned cities in the country, walk along the Chattahoochee River on the river walk or rent a bike and wend your way. Take in a great selection of public art in uptown Columbus on its distinctive sculpture walk, where you can look for original sculptures and other works spread out over about four city blocks. Download the app for a self-guided tour of works like this mural by R.C. Hagens and Butch Anthony um, at top center on your screen. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Butch later. Historic cemeteries such as Linwood, established in 1828, are unexpectedly wonderful places to roam about and see examples of more classical sculpture, or in this case, to visit the graveside of notables such as local pharmacist, Dr. John Pemberton, who concocted the very um, first original formula for Coca-Cola. Experience a perfect blend of the old and the new by taking in a performance at the historic Springer Opera House, which originally opened its doors in 1871. Next slide, please, Mike. A specific recommendation from Pasaquan's Mike McFalls is the Lunchbox Museum. And it's a fantastical journey into nostalgia while also providing a visual compendium to the history of this school mainstay. They say you can still smell the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when you open some of the lids here. From a rare depression metal lunch pail to one of the first images of Mickey Mouse on a lunchbox from the 1930s to more recent offerings like the Scooby-Doo lunchbox. 
um, let owner and aficionado Alan Woodhall in his 80s help guide you on your own personal trip down memory lane and gain a new appreciation of the impact these small examples of personal expression, because indeed your lunchbox choice says something about who you are, have, an Ameri have on American culture. Next slide, please, Mike. Travel 20 minutes southeast of Columbus and across state lines to Seal, Alabama, and discover the world of a contemporary visionary, still actively creating his own artist-designed environment. Butch Anthony, whose mural you saw in a previous slide, has designed a wonderland that is part museum gallery, part workshop, flea market, part landfill, and yes, part taxidermy. It's a modern day cabinet of curiosities. Original artworks and furniture by this artist are displayed alongside other objects that range from animal bones to purportedly the world's largest gallstone. Take in the world's first drive-through museum, which he made from shipping containers. Go to the next slide, Mike. Imagine my surprise at finding another comprehensive collection to rival the Munchbox Museum. About 45 minutes southwest of Pasaquan is the Georgia Rural Telephone Museum, which like the Munchbox Museum is the brainchild of one man. As telephones, as we used to know them, now become truly regulated to the annals of history, this museum reminds us of the transformative power this invention had on basic human communication for more than a century, with exhibits that range from the presidential switchboard of Georgian Jimmy Carter to full-scale telephone poles to the first phone of my own youth, the Fisher-Price model you see at the top. A bit of kitsch to be sure, but there is also serious collecting here, assembled by a man with a singular unapologetic passion, however quirky, which for me is the very essence of Eddie Owens Martin and Pasaquan. Next slide, please. Wanna immerse yourself in an environment created by a contemporary of Eddie Owens Martin? Travel three hours north to Paradise Garden, the former home and workplace of Baptist minister and folk artist, Howard Finster. A path from the studio, a yellow bungalow, leads to the World Folk Art Chapel. Don't wanna leave at the end of such a stimulating day here? Stay on premise at one of the rental spaces you can book through Airbnb. Our host, Mike, will talk to you a bit more about Finster in relation to Eddie Owens Martin, but here was just a taste of what awaits you there. Next slide, Mike. Back in Columbus, visit one of the largest museums in the Southeast, dedicated to both art and history. For example, did you know that blues singer Ma Rainey was born here, as was African-American artist Alma Thomas? Learn these stories or commune with a Chihuly boat sculpture, all admission free. But also make sure to visit the campus of Columbus State University, co-stewards of Pasaquan, and the impressive corn center of the visual arts set on the riverbank and featuring several spaces to view contemporary art. The Bo Bartlett Center offers more than 18,000 square feet of interactive gallery space housed in a transformed former textile warehouse. While this lovely city offers all kinds of diversions, from great restaurants to the National Infantry Museum, your ultimate destination is the small town of Buena Vista and Pasaquan. Final slide. There are so many wonders here. The sheer scale, the density of decoration, and the profusion of color, all from the imagination and hand of one fascinating human being who you will learn about this afternoon. But there is tremendous skill here when one starts to zero in on the delicate, exquisite details of individual elements and how such a vast array of ornament can exist in an ultimate visual harmony. Yet, the bombastic nature and palpable sensory, sensory vibration, which I feel even through images of this site are only part of this compelling story of a man who reinvented himself time and again manifested around him the world he wished into existence and his complete narrative must be peeled back layer by layer like an onion. There is something visceral about this place and you know it before you even set foot on it. 
I can't wait to visit it in person. And I suspect many of you will feel the same by the end of this virtual journey. I am delighted to welcome this site and your host, Mike McFalls, into the Haas family and thank him for leading us on our first foray into this magical, mystical world. My thanks to you, Mike, as well as Mackenzie, as we embark. Well, thank you, uh, Valerie. Thank you, Mackenzie. Uh, I couldn't be happier to be part of Haas uh, Columbus State University. Couldn't be happier. And Valerie, wow, what a wonderful kind of, uh, you know, introduction to uh, Southwest, South, uh, Southwest Georgia. I, I mean, you nailed all the great places, including the Lunchbox Museum and the Museum of Wonder, two of my favorite destinations when we have visitors here from out of town, especially from New York or Europe. We typically take them there. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm Mike McFalls. I'm a professor of art and a, um, a professor of art and the director of Pasquan. I'm going to put on my timer here. Um, but before I start this talk, um, I want to, about St. Ohm and Pasacoinism, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral, cultural, traditional, and unceded territory of the Muscogee Nation that once lived on the land that Pasacoan sits on today. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge those first peoples. Um, the other thing, though, I'd like to say is that I am not a Pasacoyan scholar or Pasacoan scholar in any way. I'm actually a visual artist. I'm a sculptor. Um, but I've always had an interest in visionary art environments or vernacular art environments. And I think that started because of my father. I'd have to say I thank him. I grew up in East Tennessee. And when I was young, I would go and visit Howard Finster's Paradise Gardens and never had heard of Pasacoan. And I remember it having such an impact on me as a young man that, it, you know, and I was always fascinated by the place that I constantly would bring friends to that, that location. So when I moved here from Maine uh, about 15 years ago, uh, I had first encountered Pasaquan. Um, and so I knew even back then, before the restoration, that Pasaquan was kind of one of the most amazing examples of American visionary art environments that that I have seen so um, and it was really important but it was in great disrepair at that time. However, Pasaquan's a complex place and I think it's really difficult to talk about Pasaquan uh, without talking about this gentleman Eddie Owens Martin who went by the name St. Ohm and we'll go into that in a little bit. Uh, this is the artist who creates Pasaquan, and I think it's appropriate that Eddie introduces himself. So I have this quick video for you. <laughs> okay, why don't, why don't you start out, Eddie, and, and just introduce yourself to us. Hello there, all you people. This is Marin County. And Buena Vista is the county seat, and I'm Eddie Martin. It lives here. I created and drawed and sculptured and built walls and everything. And within my heart, I always had a hope that my dream would ring. And it's rung so true to just come here. And you can see for you and for you and for all of you to cheer that there is a new way that will show you and keep you from strife. If you can be just a person and don't have to see all. So as you can see, Eddie Martin, Eddie Owens Martin is a bit of a when you talk prior to build, before he started building this in this art environment. So Eddie was one of seven kids. And while growing up in South Georgia, he always said he felt estranged, different from all the other God-fearing citizens of Buena Vista. In 1922, at the age of 14. Eddie left his home and hitchhiked to New York City, hitting the streets at the beginning of the Roaring Twenties. 
Now, according to Tom Patterson's book, St. Ohm in the Land of Pasaquan, Eddie spent the first dozen years in New York as a midnight cowboy street hustler. Later, he made ends meet by running an illicit gambling ring, dealing marijuana, working as a waiter in a gay nightclub, and finally establishing himself as a fortune teller on 42nd Street. So he had quite a life before he ends up here. And this is the front room at Pasquan where Eddie would often do his fortune telling. And this is Eddie in some of his full regalia. But while Eddie was living in New York, he was also making art. When he wasn't hustling and doing his fortune telling, he spent, spent a lot of time creating paintings and drawings and handmade jewelry that he had very little luck selling. I wanted to give you some images of Eddie in this. This is Eddie Martin in 1928 on the left. Uh, he might have at this point been what they, he called the Tattooed Contessa or the Tattooed Countess. That was another uh, nickname he had. On the top left is 1945 St. Ohm on a, doing a really a ceremonial dance on top of a building in New York City. And then on the right, we have uh, Eddie Martin, 1975, St. Ohm at Pasaquan. And, and what we're gonna do is talk a little bit about how this idea of Pasaquanism and Pasaquan comes about according to Eddie Martin. So sometime in 1935, Eddie grew ill with fever. This was when he had his first visions and he kept having visions um, after this throughout his life. Eddie said he couldn't eat. He had he was he was heaving up all this stuff like he was cleansing himself, getting rid of all that evil that had built up in him over the years. He quoted he's quoted in Tom Patterson's book. During the worst night of these illnesses, he thought he was dead. He saw a spirit leave his body. He encountered a vision of a great big man sitting. He said, "Quote some kind of god with arms as big around as watermelons." Eddie described this being's hair. He said it was long and went straight up from straight up to the top of his head. And he had a beard that was parted in the middle and went straight up the side of his face. This godlike figure told him, quote, if you follow my spirit, then you can go. But if you can't follow my spirit, then this is the end of the road for you. Soon after, Eddie had other visions and he then anointed, self-anointed himself and started signing his work, saying Ohm. So that's the story Eddie says, but I think there's other com more complex parts of this, and I'm not gonna get into too much detail, but these are examples of some of the drawings that Eddie does before he goes to Pasquan. At Pasquan, we found a large steamer trunk filled with drawings, um, and there were something between a couple trunks and some other portfolios, 1,200 drawings that are now in the archives at Columbus State University. And these are just some of those examples. These are early drawings. They're probably right around pre-vision or post-vision, um, but pre-Pasaquan, pre-building of Pasaquan. These drawings are, are from a, a show that I curated with Annie Moy in New York City at Institute 193B called Fashioning a Pasaquan. Um, after doing some research in the archives at Columbus State, we began to notice a trend in Eddie's work. You can see connections to Eddie where he's looking at New York Fashion Institute drawings. You can begin to see Eddie making references to artworks that he sees in museum. There's some evidence that Eddie probably had the ambition to even be a fashion designer or a costume designer. But something happens after that first vision. He was making paintings and drawings of New York City scenes, often bar scenes, the scenes that he was probably uh, existing in, coexisting in, and he'd have images of his friends. But then often there would be an image of a Pasaquian. A Pasaquian is like these red beings with their hair pointing straight up into the air, and they would show up in these drawings and paintings. St. Ohm left New York for good in 1956, only a few months after the Village Voice made note of him and his artwork from the year's annual review of the Washington Square Art Outdoor Art Show. Uh, there's an image of Eddie there, and they even call him the Village Wizard. So he was living in Greenwich Village at the time. The reason I'm showing you this slide is it's kind of funny, but it's the only image that we have in the archives that maybe makes reference to the place 
Passaquan. These images of this space, these uh, kind of perspective images, they're the only thing that looks like the place he ends up building in Buena Vista in 1956. St. Elm returned to Georgia. He moved into his recently deceased mother's small farmhouse. The house was seven acres, deep in the pine woods of rural Marin County. He continued working as a fortune teller while living there. He began transforming the house and its grounds into one of what I think is the most amazing art environments in America. And St. Ohm called it Passaquan. So after moving to his mother's place, he got the notion that he wanted to build something. He wasn't sure exactly what. Like many visionary artists, Pasquan evolved unconsciously, a patchwork of, of transformed that he transformed into a pluralistic utopia over the course of 30 years. He started using old rocks and bricks, which he found in the countryside. He erected walls around the place, overlaid them with cement, decorating them with ancient religious symbols and images from his imagination. As Tom Patterson said, it's kind of a mock pre-Columbian psychedelic wonderland. It is a seven acre art environment that consists of six major structures, more than 900 feet of painted masonry fences, painted tonums, decorative walkways, sculptures, hammered steel forms with oriental or with or, ornamental, excuse me, temples and pagodas. What is Pasaquan? I often am asked. And Eddie answers this question in the Tom Patterson book. He says, uh, Pasa is Spanish for the past, and Quan is an East Asian language that means the future, right? Meaning that Pasa Quan is where the past and the future are coming together, which is this place right now, Pasa Quan. However, Pasa Quan is highly influenced by James Churchward's book called The Lost Continent of Mew. It's really an Atlantic story. However, Mew is located in the South Pacific uh, before its destruction. Um, however, Eddie is very much into this book. Um, Church World claims that uh, we, we see all these archetypes in the, in, from different cultures and religions uh, throughout the ages because um, we all originated from this place, Mew. It's an origin story. Many of the symbols you see at Pasaquan come directly from this book. Eddie takes, uh, Eddie takes uh, this a little further. Um, he believes, um, Eddie believes that we have lost our way and become too capitalistic as a society. And we must reflect on these ancient cultures to correct our path. The Pasacoin, these beings that he keeps seeing in his visions are beings or maybe even aliens, gender fluid beings from the future who are presenting Eddie with a new hopeful vision of what's to come. So the next question I'm often asked when giving tours through the site, so what is Pasacoyanism? Well, hard to describe, but one thing that I've often said is when Eddie found religion, he seemed to find them all. Eddie goes out to Buena Vista and he creates his own religion, a religion where races and all creeds, all those with different sexualities and gender fluid beings can live in harmony and celebrate. And often I have to point out to my students when we're out there, he's doing this in Southwest Georgia in 1956. He's way ahead of his, of his time. His ideas are fairly progressive. In some way, it's his own utopia that he's building. As I said earlier, Eddie never felt like he fit in. He always felt like an outsider. Many times he talks about growing up in Buena Vista and being attracted to men. In the book by Tom Patterson, Eddie explains that he wanted to make a place with his own temples, his own gods, a place where he can be himself. And the funny thing is, the first thing he does is build a wall between him and his community. This is the ceremonial sand pit at Pasaquan uh, with the, the Wellhouse Pagoda in the background, probably one of my favorite locations on the site. Um, Eddie would use this location to hold court. He'd often stand on the top of the Pagoda Bridge looking down at onlookers and talking about Pasacoyanism from the platform, and then he would perform. He would come down dressed in full regalia, looking like something from a Montezuma to a Boy George. 
He'd be where he'd have his dogs, Bo, uh, Boo and Nina, on his left and right often with him. He would do a ceremonial dance in the sandpit. Some people said he would make patterns that would look like mandalas in the sand when he was finished with his dance. There is so much folklore centered. Hold on. There's so much folklore centered on Eddie. Um, and I think some of this folklore and myth that centered around Eddie was he did it on purpose to, to create a, a, a way of self preserving in a, in a sense. Um, you know, I often have to think, you know, being a gay wizard from New York City, moving down to Buena Vista in 1956 was probably pretty risky. He was interested in the occult. Everything about his sexuality was taboo. And so what, what, how do you preserve yourself? Well, you develop these myths. There's so many stories. We did an oral history here at Columbus State. And there's so many stories that people have about Eddie Martin in the town. One of my favorite stories is a cat story. Uh, there's variations on this story that we've been told. But Eddie had this ability, people say, to communicate with animals. And he would go in town dressed in full regalia, a typical southern town with the southern, you know, with the square courthouse right at the center of the town. Um, and he would park his car and he would get out. And all these cats would come jumping out of his car and he would go and do his business in town. And an hour later, he'd come back out of the store. He would do some kind of chant in front of his car, open up the car doors and all the cats would run and jump in. And these, there are stories like this over and over and over that he could charm snakes. And I mean, there, there are just multiple stories um, um, throughout the history of Eddie's um, kind of existence at, in Buena Vista. So this is the kitchen at Pasaquan, and I'm showing you just some spaces. It's impossible to show you all the spaces at the, in this place. But again, one of my favorite rooms at Pasaquan, and this is when the idea of Pasaquan and Pasaquanism is becoming more developed um, later in Eddie's life. These, uh, these images of these beings on the wall, they're Pasaquans. These Pasaquans are wearing what he called levitation suits or power suits. Um, and as you can see, these beings are floating off the ground. The theory of, of the future at Pastaquan is that you wear one of these suits, you meditate, then the suit pushes pressure on the body at pressure points, and then you levitate to transport yourself around in this utopian universe that Eddie called Pastaquan. So St. Elm continues to work without much notoriety or fame from for roughly about 30 years. Pasquan was briefly noted in a few magazines and newspapers here and there. This is the back porch at Pasquan. For example, uh, St. Ohm's paintings and sculptures, a few drawings and jewelry and some ritualistic costumes are, have found their way into collections through different outsider or visionary art exhibitions that he was included in but not often, he didn't sell much. Um, the closest thing he got to fame was an exhibition called Missing Pieces that led him to an invite to DC from Rosalind Carter and Governor George Busby's wife, Mary. And actually Eddie and Howard Fensner go up to DC together. There's an essay in the book called The Sec Sacred and Profane by Dor Dorothy Joyner and it describes basically Eddie and um, Howard marching through the airport. Eddie was playing his drum and Finstner was preaching um, kind of in this frenetic way about the kind of second coming through the Washington International Airport. And Miss Busby is in between them. And she and Dorothy Joyner describes Mary as being startled and and really just truly embarrassed to be with these two yahoos. I, I love the idea and wish I could have been uh, uh, at that <laughs> airport that day. So, but the thing about this is Eddie talks about this and he later uh, laments and says, nothing ever did come out of it. Then people still won't buy any of my art. So he, he really was a little bitter, right? And in fact, I think there was a bit of a, a um, you know, that, that Eddie and Howard 
weren't getting along as well. Eddie was a bit jealous, I think, of Howard because Howard was having a lot more financial success selling his art and his ideas than Eddie was. So later this last year in January, 2020, I had the opportunity to give a tour to Jimmy Carter and his family. Um, and I had the, in the book, In the Land of Pasquan, um, Eddie, there's a brief passage about two paragraphs long where Eddie describes telling the fortune of Jimmy Carter at Pasaquan before he lost the election to Ronald Reagan. In fact, in the book, he, he says that he told Jimmy Carter that he was gonna lose the election to a man with good hair, um, which I found very funny. So as I was there, I had, I had the opportunity to sit down with, with um, Jimmy and Rosalind in that room where his fortune would have been told. And I read that passage and Jimmy Carter said to me, he said, I don't recall having my fortune told. And Rosalind said, yeah, I, I recall being here. And she said she remembered Eddie's dogs, the two German shepherds, Boo and Nina, attacking the uh, Secret Service agent. So the myth of Eddie still continues, but I have some suspicion other things were going on there. And we can talk about that maybe during the question and answer period. So in 1986, at the age of 77, Eddie's health was declining. He took his life and shot himself with a 38 caliber pistol. St. Ohm was a visionary artist who had no formal training and reveled in the intuitive art process. He was influenced by many artistic traditions, including Mesoamerican, African, Eastern art, but the content of his work was constructed, constructed from personal visions and his life experiences. His life was a series of journeys, both physical and spiritual. Soon after St. Ohm's death, the Pasquan Preservation Society took ownership of this site. And without the Pasquan Preservation Society for 30 years working relentlessly to keep this site intact, I don't think the site would be here. So we give the Pasquan Pre Preservation Society a lot of uh, kudos for making sure that Eddie's vision has continued into the future. In 2015, the Pasquan Preservation Society connected with Columbus State and the Kohler Foundation. Kohler is one of the only major foundations in the country that is committed to the preservation of art environments like Pasquan. And this project is one of the largest art environment preservation initiatives that the Kohler uh, Foundation has ever taken on. It was a multi-million dollar project that was completed at the beginning of 2017. In this picture, you'll see uh, students working on Pasquan and actually, and this is on the left, there's, this is the um, Parma Conservation Group. They are the subcontractor group that helped us do the paint conservation work. And on the right is a student that worked with the International Artifacts Group from Houston. So CSU's priority is to preserve, maintain, and provide access to and assist in the uh, interpretation of Pasquan. We aspire to give visitors a unique insight into the intuitive artistic process by engaging people through diverse programming, interdisciplinary workshops, lectures, seminars, retreats, performances. We envision Pasquan becoming a culturally enriching leader in the region while assisting in uh, economic development. We wanna carry on the vision of Eddie Martin. Since we've opened the doors of Pasquan, we have had thousands of visitors from all over the world. We have local school groups and we've developed curriculum in the local school system that centers on Pasaquan and inclusivity. We have universities like the University of Georgia, Auburn, West Georgia, Valdosta State, Georgia State, Georgia College, you name it, from various disciplines coming out and doing workshops at Pasquan. We receive grants from the Georgia Council for the Arts, the Community Foundation, the Georgia Department of Economic Development, and the Kohler Foundation. And we've continued to have numerous articles written about Pasquan in places like Hypoallergic and Raw Vision. But one thing we realized is we wanted to continue the vision, create new knowledge and new creative projects centered on Pasquan. Um, and we realized a place like Pasquan is a, is a place that's not going to change. It's the artist's home, but we can bring this we can bring this message about Pasquan 
outside of the boundaries of the walls. Um, so we just started an artist in residency program. Uh, one of our first artists in residence was James Ogborn, who ended up becoming a faculty at CSU, and he wrote an opera called Eddie Stone Song, The Odyssey of the First Passacoyan. And then we ended up working with the Strobe School of Music, we worked with the theater program here, and an English professor, and it became this great cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary exchange where we, uh, where students from theater, music, and art were working together to produce this opera at the site. And the opera would go up into the well house and into the sand pit. And it was about the story of Eddie's life before he put the first stone down at Pasquan. It was a beautiful evening where we had two uh, showings, um, two nights, and they both sold out about 300 people. And it was a great, great experience. And the great thing about this opera is the opera ended when the sun went down and the cicadas took over. The other thing we did is we've been developing exhibitions and, and participating in exhibitions because we also know there's a lot of people that will never be able to get to the middle of nowhere, Georgia. So we felt we could take it to people um, in other locations. So Pasquan, since we've taken over at CSU, has had 21 exhibitions with St. Ohm's work, both shown nationally and internationally. We've shown in locations like the Drawing Center, the um, uh, Intuit, Institute 193, um, this is an exhibition from the High Museum, curated by Katie Gentleson and, and Philip March Jones, called Way Out There, The Art of the Southern Back Roads, and Eddie was one of the artists that was selected to be in it. The show was based on the poems of Jonathan Williams, and the photos were, uh, and the photos of Guy Mendez and Roger Manley. But another project that we've been doing is we worked with artists like Sia Wolfock, where they in, engage with Eddie's unfinished work. So Saya came to me and she said she wanted to do a booth at the Outsider Fair uh, with some fortune tellers and her projections where she would complete some of Eddie's unfinished pieces, which this is an example of. Well, what I like to show is this show of hers, the uh, Visionary Reality Outpost, and Saya would probably say the same thing. Eddie's in St. Ohm and Pasco and the ideas that she encountered while being at Pasquan have had a direct impact and influence on the body of work that she's currently and making. And you can see that directly in, in these images. Excuse me, my throat's getting a little dry. So St. Ohm is having his most meaningful impact in the art world with national and international exhibitions. Artists across the globe are visiting Pasquan and being inspired by St. Ohm's work. It led to this show called Vibrations. Most people say you spelled vibrations wrong. Eddie used to say he hopes people come to Pasquan and they feel the vibrations of his work, not the vibrations, uh, which was different. It was a, a kind of a, a, a feeling that you get from the inside of your gut and it kind of radiates out and continues on long after you see it. And we thought Vibrations of Pascom was a fit name for this exhibition. This was curated by myself and Jonathan Walls, the curator at the Columbus Museum. And what we did is showcase Eddie Martin's work with contemporary artists that claim to be influenced by his work or even former, a lot of these were former residents of Pascom's uh, residency program. And this is Eddie's work in in that space. Lastly, some of the things we do at Pasquan is we have a thing, an event at Pasquan called Pacifest, one of our favorite events to do at Pasquan. And we've had three of them since the opening, and really four if you count our uh, virtual one during the pandemic that I'll talk about in a second. Um, but what we try to do is, is celebrate the uniqueness and the diversity of Southern vernacular art. At usually a Pacifest, we have 700 to 1,000 people. At the site, we have artists, musicians. We have the Technocolor face painter, the cosmic cos cosmetologist, the Pasacoyan fashion show, cosmic pickles, snake calling contests, you name it, we're doing it out there. Um, and it is fun, it's weird, and it's playful, to say the least. But during the pandemic, you'll see we also did a virtual Pacifest out at the site. And these are some of the musicians and the artists, which ended up becoming an album called The Circle of Adams that we 
create it with Institute 193, and I will show you a little bit of that. I heard that St. Elm traveled all around and, and, and gathered up all these influences, these disparate influences that have created this magical place. And uh, that's kind of what it's all about. It's going and becoming uh, more than the sum of your parts. So it seemed logical to sing uh, this song. It's called The Sum of What We've Been. Riding that lucky hand Holding in your palm One grain of sand But it's shining bright Like a diamond ring Whispering you can do anything Yeah, yeah When you're kicking it around And round in luck Round and round We've been kicking up and down until our chains give in You can't testify about no highway Till you come home again Being more than just the sum Yeah, the sum The sum of what you've been So that was Jim White and his daughter Sadie um, But we had several artists that all have some Some of them wrote songs that, that were about Pasaquan And some just sang songs that they said were inspired by Pasaquan, um, you know, but it was a great recording session. And one thing you'll notice with the record, what we wanted to do is make sure that we captured the atmosphere of Pasaquan. Pasaquan has a strange sound and you can always hear the cicadas when you're there. And it was really important that you could hear the cicadas throughout these recordings because it was done on the site at that time. And then we made these videos as well. And they're all online and you can, visit Institute 193 to see them. Finally, I'm gonna end this so that you can see some images of old images of Eddie that are from a, a more recent project uh, Tedeschi Trucks Band did out at Pasquan. It just was released in June, 2022. Whoops. So this is called Tedeschi Trucks Plan, I Am The Moon, episode one, Crescent. Um, and the song is Pasquan, and it's a long, long song and then a bit of a jam band, but I'm going to end it with this end of this video so you can kind of get a sense because there's a lot of old images from the archives of Eddie in this, in, on this video. So I'll give you a good, a good sense of what you're seeing here. So I thought it was fitting to end with Eddie taking a bow. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. The, this is just a brief kind of entry into Pasaquan and Pasaquanism and St. Ohm. Um, uh, and I'm free to take any questions. 
Mike, thank you so much. I um, This has been truly a pleasure just to learn about this site and about all the incredible things that have happened there uh, past uh, and present and sounds like future as well, things to come. Um, and just sharing the, the story and legacy of, of Eddie's life and environment. Um, we are uh, going to move into the Q&A portion of this presentation. Um, and so actually we do have a question waiting, but um, for those of you that have any curiosities, please send them in to us through the Q&A box. Uh, so this question is about uh, Eddie's living space. So given that his home was more of an artwork than a living space, where did he actually do his living, make his meals, sleep, et cetera? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, Eddie is living in his art, right? Um, you know, his kitchen is his art. His, he's making his furniture. He's making his clothing. Um, it is the place that he lives and works um, all the time. And I don't think he ever sees a separation between art and living. Um, so I, and I think that's an important thing, even when we bring students out there, especially my students who are art students, I said, look, this guy, you know, lived, breathed, and was art all the time. So, but I think it's a good question. They, he never, and there, nothing was very, it seems to me, precious to Eddie. I think we often look at art and say, oh, it's, it's really important. It's really precious. I think if, if Eddie woke up one day and didn't like the color of something, he'd change it. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't, it didn't have to stay that way. It was, it was the art was constantly in flux around him. Partly was because of the way he constructed things, but the other part was, you know, I think he um, he realized that he, you know, this was his world and he could he could do what he wanted to. It. Yeah, truly, I, I like what you said earlier in your presentation that he really did create the space for him and and the myths around himself as well, which is really yeah. fascinating. And there are a ton uh, of those. <laughs> yeah. Um, Someone says, uh, thrilled to be introduced to such a free spirit. Is the book that you've uh, referenced a few times still available? Yeah, there's a couple books, but the main book that I'm sourcing here is Tom Patterson's book, In the Land of Pasaquan. Um, and it's a great reference. It's a little bit salacious. What Tom did was pretty much interview. Um, you know, it's just a direct interview with Eddie for mm. page after page. And and Te Eddie tells his life story. Um, and it, in, in fact, it's published after Eddie's death. So Eddie dies before the book ever came out. Um, and then at, Tom just released a new memoir. I wish I had it here. I cannot remember the title of it, um, which has a couple chapters about Eddie Martin in it, which is great. And then the other book that I was referencing is a book called The Sacred and Profane. Um, and that has the essay about Pasquan, a little more academic. Um, and it's about, uh, it's from, the essay was written by Dorothy Joyner, an art historian who teaches in LaGrange College, just north of here. Got it. Thank you. So there, there's quite a bit of writing out there to reference. and Yeah, and there's lots of essays and articles, but those two were mainly the ones I was referencing here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Uh, who were the original preservationists of the site? Uh, were they friends or how were they connected to St. Ohm? Yeah, that's a good question. I kind of briefly go over that. St. Ohm passes away in 1986, in April 1986. Um, and he has a will. In his will, he wills the site to the Columbus Museum of Art. Um, they did, and in fact, Fred Bussell was the director, I think, at the time. They, the, the, the Columbus Museum, probably rightfully so, refused the site because of the commitment it took to keep it up. Um, and so there's a group in Buena Vista called the Historic Society. That was second on his handwritten will, apparently. Um, and that group didn't exist. There's a great story that Eddie took this garden club basically which was the Univista Hi Historic Society I believe they called themselves and they were a garden club of a lot of the local ladies in town and he took them through Pasaquan. The story I hear is Eddie walked around Pasaquan and showed every one of the penises at Pasaquan to these ladies and embarrassed them on purpose. <laughs> That's the story Fred tells me but anyhow but he had such a great time he gives the the site to them mm -hmm. um, and so 
they don't exist and then they write, later reconvene and they turn themselves. They become what I quickly went over, but they become the Pasiguan Preservation Society, which is a lot of locals from Buena Vista and Columbus, um, really led by Fred Fussell and Kathy Fussell. But there's a lot of, you know, Penny. Um, I wish I could name all the names. There was a, a major group. And without that group, I think that place would have been destroyed. Um, yeah, I do not think most people in the town valued it. It sounds like uh, there was definitely a, a clear community effort um, and over time as well, though interesting to hear that it's kind of shifting groups that have been stewards of the site. Yeah, and like I said, and then in 2015, the PPS gifts the site to Colum or to uh, excuse me to the Kohler Foundation during the preservation, and then Kohler gifts it to the university to be the 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 site stewards. Site stewards. Gotcha. Um, so another question about how to visit the site today. Um, like if there's reservations, if you just show up, how does it how does it work if you'd like to come see Pasquan in person? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the kind of question a director should have put at the end of his talk, but he didn't. <laughs> no <laughs> Very good. You got it covered. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, at least somebody asked that question. Pasquan's open uh, 10 months out of the year. We're not open on in July because it's just too darn hot. Um, and it's not open in December. And we are open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, 10 to 5 p.m. We have the second Pasquan who lives out there. We call him Charles Fowler, but he definitely has taken on the spirit of Eddie Martin. Um, and he will easily give you a tour, even if you don't want one, he probably will give you a tour. Um, he's the friendliest guy in Buena Vista. Um, but the other thing is you can set up tours with myself or even other patrons or, or uh, docents like Fred Fussell who knew um, Eddie Martin personally. If you call ahead, we usually ask for, for t like a guided tour with the professors or some of our docents, basically $10 a head, 10 people, $100 total. That helps just cover our costs. But gotcha. honestly, Charles, I think is, he's usually in a gl glitter robe and he's got his hair straight up in the air. And he, most people think he made the place. So, but he'll give you a tour if you want to. Nice. But you get, you're getting a full experience with him is what it sounds like. Yes. It's, yeah. it's great. It's great. And he's, he's wonderful. In fact, we're, we're actually in a second phase of a restoration right now. Um, and he's helping because he, he, Charles was one of my students and he worked on the original restoration um, and we just couldn't get rid of him. He just stayed out there. So we hired him as the caretaker, um, but he's just, he's delightful. And um, I get messages from people from all over the country saying how much fun they have meeting Charles Fowler. That's amazing. It sounds like it was meant to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mike. Um, I just wanna wrap us up here and just point out a couple of things that were dropped in the chat um, before we say goodbye. Um, so to our audience, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this event is brought to you by the James Castle House, uh, the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, and of course, Pasaquan. Um, a big thank you to Valerie and to Mike uh, for their contributions uh, to this year's virtual road trip. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to our interpreters today um, for providing that service. So uh, I popped in the chat all a whole bunch of links um, to related events, resources, uh, mailing list, uh, Pasaquan's website is there, as well as uh, two links that lead to, I believe it's the oral histories and uh, the site's Matterport. So you can virtually explore um, Pasaquan if you can't quite make it to Georgia anytime soon. Um, so this presentation has been amazing and this road trip uh, continues onward. Um, we're actually going to be venturing into the desert home of Georgia O'Keeffe uh, located in New Mexico. So if that is of interest to you, I hope you will come back and join us for that event. Uh, and of course, if you wanna start planning your own summer road trips, um, I would highly recommend using the guide here. Um, most of the Haas, uh, Haas sites are represented here, although not all of them. Um, Valerie, you'll need to do an update, uh, hopefully soon. Uh, and it's available at uh, the James Castle House uh, website, as well as many other online retailers. And a recording of this presentation is going to be available in the coming weeks. And you can find this and other recordings of uh, the Haas virtual road trip on the James Castle House YouTube channel. 
So thank you so much, Mike. Thank you so much, Valerie. Any final thoughts before we say farewell? No. Thank you, Mike, for just an extraordinary experience. Thank you. Can't wait to come. Thank you for having me. It was our pleasure. And we hope you guys felt the vibrations. There you go. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks, everyone. And have a wonderful day.